right? Malachi chapter 4. I want to preach a message to you called Christ, our sun and shield, but their destruction. Malachi chapter 4 and verse number 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. It shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name. Look, look at what it says here. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Amen. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to, the, to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Father, Lord, please bless us as we look into this today, as we lift up Christ tonight, the Son of Righteousness, our Son and our shield. May we lean on you, Lord. May we see you, dear Jesus as our protector, as our son and our shield. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, it's ama the sun is really amazing. When you think about the sun in the sky, it's amazing. And here it's not an accident that the Bible calls Jesus Christ the son of righteousness, right? And we're going to show you how the sun that we see out in the sky is likened to Jesus Christ. It says, you know, I'm going to brag on Jesus a little bit here this afternoon, and I know of no better subject to cover than Jesus Christ himself. It's true that Jesus is the Word, and when we preach the Word, we preach Jesus. But we need more sermons on Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, so you would understand and know Jesus, and you would understand. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. For someone like Paul to say that I may know him, you say, well, I already know him. No, you don't know him like you should. You don't. Because fear tends to go away the closer I get to Jesus. The closer I know Jesus, that fear goes away. I have a reverence for him, but that fleshly fear goes away more as I come closer and I draw closer to Jesus and I know who he is. And Paul said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Oh, stop, preacher, please. I like the first part of that. I don't like the last part of that. See, that's the part that you're never, ever, ever, ever going to get to know God until you're willing to fellowship in his sufferings. You are not going to. You are to be made in the, to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what he said. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Man, you like that. You and I like that. The power of his resurrection, that resurrected life, that victorious life, right? The power of his resurrection. And what's it next? That I may know when the power of his and the fellowship of his sufferings. You don't want that. How come? Because we all love this life way too much. We don't want to fellowship in his sufferings, but you'll never get to know him until you do. You draw closer to the Lord as you fellowship in his sufferings. What were his sufferings? The sufferings of the cross, the sufferings of betrayal, the sufferings of reproach, the sufferings of temptations and trials of this life, the sufferings of turmoil in the heart, uh, the sufferings of dealing with other people that are unbelievers, the sufferings of going through this life, right? Those sufferings, the trials of this life. They are for the sufferings to know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul said that. You would think that Paul knew him quite well. He knew him better than you and I. But honestly, we must all admit with Paul that I may know him. Because we can never know him well enough. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. 
The longer I serve him, the more I see my dire need to know him better. To pray more, to serve him, to surrender to him. The more I understand that I need the intercession of Christ on my behalf, the more I, 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 I must make much of Christ in my life, that he must increase and I must decrease. You know, that's the real problem. That battle that you have, that battle that rages inside of a man and a woman. You know what that battle is? The battle is that he must increase and I must decrease. That really it is. It's that self-denial of the disciple. It's denying ourselves. Because we are all too fond of ourselves. Really are. Satan hates when we adore and honor Christ the Lord. And I want to talk to you about the Son of Righteousness and our shield who Jesus is. <laughs> sermon after sermon can be preached, and book after book has been written. And like John said, <laughs> if you wrote down everything, the world could not contain the books that could be written of all that Jesus has done. Right? So first, I want you to look at the sun. I want you to look at how the sun is in the sky and compare that sun to the sun of righteousness, Jesus Christ. So first of all, you know, it's interesting that the sun rots some things and sweetens others. Think about that for a moment. If you look at the first verses of this chapter, you will see a great paradox. Malachi chapter 4, verse number 1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. You know, that's how it works. On some, when the sun of righteousness shines, it's a blessing. On others, not so much. If you see a hot, steamy pile of dung or manure on the road, the sun makes it stink very bad, very badly. It magnifies the rottenness of that carcass that is burning, right? When that sun beats down, that stench comes, doesn't it? Yep. That dead carcass basking in the sun, it stinks worse. Then on a cloudy day when the sun is not heating it up, some seven times hotter than what it would be when the sun is not out, it's not as quite as bad. Have you ever seen manure baking in the sun? Smell the stench of rotten garbage as the sun heats it up? Huh? When the sun shines on rotten garbage and the temperature alone and the sun rays make it stink much worse. You have to understand something. The sun can burn things and then the maggots come out and it rots even worse and the stench is terrible. Well, that same sun, when it shines on flowers and plants and other crops, causes them to blossom and grow. And that a sweet-smelling savor comes, doesn't it? Because without the sunshine, those plants would not grow. Those crops would not grow. Without warmth from the sun, plants would die. But we see in the summer, in the springtime, in the harvest, the sun aids those beautiful flowers and plants, and healing comes with the rising of the sun. Like when the sun of righteousness rises with healing in his wings, right? Now then, look at the spiritual lessons of the sun of righteousness. When his rays shine on some men, it causes them to harden their hearts. And the more he works, the more they harden their hearts. Exodus 4.21, and the Lord said unto Moses, Exodus 4.21, and the Lord said unto Moses, when thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hands. But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Think about that. God did many marvelous works in front of Pharaoh. And every miracle that he caused, that he allowed to happen, every miracle hardened Pharaoh's heart even harder. Is it not because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil? God knew Pharaoh's heart that he would not let his people go. So then the more his miracles and signs and wonders were poured out, the son of righteousness, by the son of righteousness, did the harder and harder and harder Pharaoh resist. 
But then you take the Apostle Paul, who saw that same son of righteousness, and he warred against God and the son of righteousness, but it did him no good because God had his number and Paul was going to be healed and not hardened. Because Acts chapter 9, verse number 3, if you'll turn there, you'll see when that son of righteousness arose. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into that city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. That son of righteousness shone on Paul and what happened on Saul, and what happened? He was converted. But see, that sun can shine on some, and it darkens them, and their heart gets darkened. But when it shines on others, it brightens it, their souls, and they turn. What did Jesus say? He, sa- uh, he said, or what did Paul say? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And, and he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Then another verse in the Bible, it talks about that, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. That's what Paul did when that son of righteousness arose with healing in his wings, healed Paul, saved his soul, and then what happened? To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified. By faith that is in me. That son of righteousness had a purpose, and it was to heal many. With Saul, who would become Paul. He used Paul to turn them from darkness to light. But the son did accomplish its duty as well on Pharaoh, because God said he would get him glory. Exodus 14, 4. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts so that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. He said, you know what? I'm going to harden his heart, but when that son of righteousness arises, it's going to burn Pharaoh up. And he said, I will get me honor. He said, I'll be honored upon Pharaoh. The harder Pharaoh's heart got, the more Christ was honored. The son of righteousness burns some up in his rays, as he will in the end of the world when he comes. But if you'll notice that same paradox there, it says, And then all that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth in 2 Thessalonians, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When Jesus comes, he's going to be our light, our son of righteousness, that rises with healing in his wings. Right? He's going to be that to us, and he's going to be life to us, but to them he will be death. Because when he comes, he shall destroy them with the brightness of his coming. When that son of righteousness rises, he will destroy them and he will heal us. Jesus will destroy those who would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So then that strong delusion comes, right? This is the same passage it talks about in Malachi chapter 4, verse number 1. For behold, the day cometh that that shall burn as an oven. And the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. It shall leave them neither root nor branch. Think about that. What else does the sun do, and how could it be compared to the sun of righteousness? Number two, the sun shines in darkness, and its light is needed for man. Without the sun giving its light, the world becomes a very dark place. In the winter months up north, when we don't get the sunshine we need, we become deficient. I'm going to read you some of these statistics here uh, and some of these facts. Cooler temperatures can bring on gloomy moods, says one scientist, scientific arg- um, article. Whether you call it the winter blues, cabin fever, or seasonal affective disorder, doctors often chalk up cold weather mood dips to lack of sunshine. In fact, a study published by the American Journal uh, of Geriatric Psychiatry found that people with lower levels of vitamin D are 10 times more likely to be depressed than those who have a healthy dose of the so-called sunshine vitamin. People in Alaska, other places like that where the sun doesn't shine for a while, they get gloomy, depressed, and want to die. Right? 
depression rises in winter time too in places where the sun is not out as long right you you ever been around people on cloudy days if you get a succession of those cloudy days in bad weather where the sun doesn't shine for a while and everybody's kind of cranky and nobody's in a really good mood and everything else why because it's affecting them it affects them Basically, it comes down to the, le- to the to levels of the hormone serotonin in your brain, explains one doctor, spokesperson for the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics. With, with exposure to bright light like sunlight, serotonin will increase. If you catch a bit of the sun and your disposition should get sunnier, too. You can also take advantage of, some people say, light therapy in the coldest and dark months. Anyway, that's their opinion. Here's the point. The point is the point is this is that you know as well as I do. Spurgeon used to talk about this. He said a lot of preachers would would get depressed a lot of times because they don't break from their studies and go outside and go for a walk and get outside in the sun. If you find yourself cooped up all day and you get in a bad mood, get outside and go for a walk. Quit sitting inside all day. It's not good for you. You don't need to sit there and roost on a computer or anything else. Get outside and go for a walk. Get some fresh air. Breathe. Right? Don't sit inside all day. Go outside. Get some air. Get some light. I'm not a doctor, but I knew, do know from experience that the lack of sunlight causes mood swings among people, depression, and discouragement. It could definitely aid it and make it much worse. But so it is with the child of God. If Jesus withdraws his healing light for a short time, we become spiritually deficient. Discouragement, depression, and doubts and fears come in. Because he is the son of righteousness that rises with healing in his wings. And if you don't have those rays of sunshine of the Lord Jesus Christ, of that son of righteousness on you, with fresh communion and fresh light from above, if you don't have that, if you're not experiencing that walking in communion with the Lord, don't wonder that you start to get discouraged when God takes and does not, when God does not shine that light of his countenance upon you. You'll feel it. You'll know it. And I recommend more doses of the Word of God, more Jesus, more Bible, more praise, more prayer. Amen. More prayer, more praise, more Bible, more singing, more focus on the Lord himself and not on your trial. More Jesus. Amen. He is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. If you need that, if you are deficient of that, then you need to go to him. More. Say, but I've went and I haven't felt the light of his countenance. Then continue to go. God never told you to stop. But so much the more. As you see the day approaching, so much the more do you need those rays from the sun when you don't feel them, when you don't feel the light of his countenance upon you, when you are discouraged, when you are down, so much the more do you need to go to him and pray to him and ask God to help you and seek his face. You know, when you don't do that, when you don't seek that sweet fellowship and communion, and perhaps that's why the light has not shined for a while, because you haven't been seeking it. Maybe you haven't been hungering and thirsting after it. So maybe the Lord gave you some cloudy days so you would beg for the sun to shine again. You know, when you don't seek that communion, when you don't do that, it's kind of like a doctor telling you, well, go outside and get some sun, and you're like, okay, and you don't do it. And you don't follow the prescri- the method to heal you. You know, there's a lot of doctors that fire patients. You know why? Because they, they, they know that they won't help. They won't listen to their instructions. So they stop instructing them. Right? Now, Jesus isn't like that. He's not going to fire you. But he might fire you up a bit. Right? And one of those methods is for him to not to shine the light of his countenance upon you, so you beg for it, so you ask God for it, so you seek his face, so you go to him. Until Jesus shines the light on you, it gets very dark. 
Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted me? When distress comes, we're to seek the son of righteousness. You know, that darkness that lost men grope in in the Bible, it says they grope and they gripe and they cannot see the light and they will not enter the light because their deeds are evil and men love darkness rather than light. But not so with the saints. They need the son of righteousness to come to them with healing in his wings so they are refreshed and strengthened. When Christ is not near us, it is like a spiritual winter and we are cold and we are deficient and begin to get discouraged. We begin to get down and discouraged. Because Jesus Christ is that son of righteousness and brings healing in his wings. You know, here's another one. Avoiding daylight could make you even sicker. A healthy dose of vitamin D gives your immune system a boost, which decreases your chance of developing infections and the flu. To knock out a pesky cold, try to spend about 10 to 15 minutes outside. Make sense? Get in the sun. Get some sun, right? A lack of sunlight could wreak havoc on your body, says another, long after the sun goes down. Research shows that spending an extended amount of time in artificial lighting or staring at electronic screens causes serious sleep problems. In fact, if you skimp on the sun's rays by staying indoors, you can throw off your circa circadian, I don't know if I'm saying that right, so if I'm not, sorry, rhythm, your body's internal clock, which could mean you're not sleeping deeply enough and may easily trigger insomnia. Looking at a computer screen too much and not getting enough real light. Boy, that'll preach. There's a lot to that. Let me just say this in more ways than one. That's true physically and that's true spiritually. And I'll tell you, when you are not getting enough of the Bible in you, if you're not getting enough communion with the Lord, if that son of righteousness does not shine you, God may withhold your sleep from you. So you do seek his face. And so you do depend on him. Mm -hmm. So you actually depend on him. You actually commune with him. You actually need him. And you know your need of him. Amen. But also in the case of, you know, a lot of times people will spend more time on social media than they will with the Lord. They'll spend more on YouTube videos than they do on the Lord. Let me ask you, what do you spend your day doing? For where your heart is, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where is your heart? Where is it? What is it on? Is it wasting time on the computer in utter nonsense that doesn't, doesn't build you spiritually in your most holy faith? Is it spent on your home and building your home? As a lady, you can either build your home or you can tear it down. It is much easier to tear it down. It takes work to build it. Because you don't have to do anything to tear it down. Just do nothing. And you're doing a good job of tearing it down. Amen. Just do nothing. And you'll tear it down. Right? Just do nothing. Now let me ask you a question here. And please pay attention. Don't get distracted. This is important. Let me ask you, what are you doing? Are you spending more time in front of a computer screen and giving God like five minutes of your time? And acting like you're sanctified before God? And acting like you're walking with God? And you really want to hear from God? Are you spending more time in the world and entertained by the world than you are hungering and thirsting after righteousness? And then sit and wonder why you don't have that joy of the Lord like you should. Wondering why trials are continuing to come in your life and you don't have the strength to bring forth to fight those trials. You know, I, 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 all of us have it too easy. We do, pretty much, compared to others around the world, 
right? And because of that, you know, I guess I'm, I'm going to pick on some women here, okay? <laughs> and and, and I, I'm not doing this because I want to be mean. I'm doing this because I, I just think it's a danger. I think it's a huge danger. Here's a huge danger. Women that don't have enough to do or think they don't have enough to do in their home and they're wasting their time out in Internet land, wasting their time out in the world, wasting their time on social media, wasting their time on YouTube, wasting their time. And they're not building their house, but they're tearing it down by doing nothing. See, no, I'm not taking bricks. and No, you're just causing it to, like, crumble. Because if you ain't building, you're destroying Because it starts to, it starts to decay. Because you're not doing anything. You got to start building. You got to start building your home. You that are single in your lives, are you building or are you tearing down? If you're doing nothing, you're tearing down. You're tearing down. How much are you working on your spiritual life? How much are you working on being the spouse that you need to be? How much are you working on being the man that you need to be or the lady that you need to be or the young man that you need to be? How much? And how much of Christ do you have? How much of communication with Christ do you have? Is it a chore? Is it just something you fit into a little time bracket and check off? Or is it a hunger and thirst after Christ? You know, the longer you're saved, there's a danger that comes in that you will get used to things the way that they are and that you will forget to hunger and thirst after Christ and after righteousness. And you will think that you are fine and you will abide by the place you have. But life moves on. Challenges move on. Trials move on. And guess what doesn't move on with your spiritual life? You're back here and the mountain's up here. The war is up here that you have to fight and you're down in the valley trying to survive. And your faith hasn't grown because you're not fighting. You're not, you're, you're not aggressive. You know, what, you know what really stinks? I'm going to tell you what really stinks. And this isn't even part of my sermon, but that's okay. This is what really stinks. What really stinks is to watch God's people not hunger and thirst after righteousness, not desire it as their necessary food, not go after it and take it by force. You walk through this Christian life and you dawdle in the Christian life. And you're not aggressive. And you're not, you're not aggressive with it. Where is your hunger and thirst and your passion for God? Where is your passion for Christ? Where is it? I don't care how long you've been saved and how much Bible you know. Where is your passion for Christ? Where are you hungering and thirsting and asking God to be your all and meet your needs and answer your prayers? When are you seeking God's face? Your husband can't live out your spiritual life for you. And it's a shame if you as a wife drag your husband down because you're not spiritually, you're not hungering, seeking after righteousness. The same goes for a husband. It's a shame if you are dragging your family down because you are not walking in the spirit and you are not obeying God and you are not hungering and thirsting and strengthening your family. I liken that to the church as well. It's a shame for you. If you are a member of this body and you are not hungering and thirsting after righteousness, if you have no food to bring to the table, let me ask you a question. What if one of your brothers and sisters came, with, came to you and they needed advice from you? Would you have enough to feed them? Have you been communing with God enough that you could feed them something that would help them? I don't mean your vain thoughts and the vanity of your heart. I mean, is there something from God's word that you could take them with passion, with sympathy, with love and with care and share it with them and help them? Children, have ye any meat? Have ye any meat? Do you think that you have an excuse because you're a wife and not a husband? 
that you should not have meat? He asked his disciples' children, have ye any meat? Do you? What could you offer? What could you help? What have you feasted on all week? What have you feasted on all week? What have your eyes looked upon all week, and what have you feasted on all week? Is it the son of righteousness with healing in his wings? Have you communed with him? Have you communed with him daily? Have you gotten alone with God and got something from God, and he spoke to your heart, and you know it, and he showed you something, and he taught you something, and you can help others with it? Do you have that? Good question. When the son of righteousness withdraws his light from you, sleep is one of the first things that goes. David felt far from the son of righteousness at times. Psalm 119, 146. He said, Psalm 119, 146, I cried unto thee, save me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. I prevented the, I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried I hoped in thy word. David said, mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. David said he lost some sleep because he was studying God's word. He said he lost some sleep because he was depending on God. He said, I, I wanted to commune with God and I wanted to know him, so I lost some sleep. I needed to hear from God, he said. So I, I, I withheld. He said, he said, mine eyes prevent the night watches. <laughs> Means I was up. Right? That I might meditate in thy word. Hear my voice according to thy loving kindness. O Lord, quicken me according to thy judgment. You know, without the son of righteousness and his presence near us, we won't sleep so well until we desire him to shine upon us. That desire. Number five, we need the sun to shine for warmth. Even in the winter times, we wish the sun to come out and warm things up. Man, it always makes the day warmer in the winter time when it's freezing and the sun comes out. It's nice, right, to sit in the sun when it's cold. The sun is so important in warming the earth up for the growth, for vitality. Without the sun, we would freeze to death. Right? The Bible says that the love of many shall wax cold in these end times. And Jesus warned us. He warned about how dangerous it is for the child of God to become lukewarm and not to be hot. Not to be hot. The answer for the coldness and the darkness that sets in is the son of righteousness who comes with healing in his wings. That sun comes and he shines on us. Revelation 3, 14. We talked about this last week, but I'll read it again. Revelation 3, 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. When the Christian soul gets cold, when our love and dedication to the Lord waxes cold, the Son of Righteousness will come with rebukes and with the rod of correction. To put some fire under our spiritual britches that we would burn hot. Let me ask you a question. Have you caught yourself lukewarm? No fire, no passion, no desire to learn from God. You're settled and at ease in Zion. At ease. A little fascinated by the world. A little taken by the world. The glimmer of the world attracting you more. The only thing that can cure that is the son of righteousness who rises with healing in his wings. 
because he melts us and brings us to tears of repentance when his presence comes near. It will warm our hearts with love and dedication to him again. He will stoke the fires again. There is warmth when Christ is near. There's warmth when he is close by. Psalm 8411. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So when God hold, withholds things from you, it's because it wouldn't be good for you. Sometimes God withholds things from us because it wouldn't be good. It says no good thing will he withhold from us who walk uprightly. If you don't walk uprightly, he might withhold some things too. Amen. You'll notice that the son of righteousness, Jesus Christ, this is another text proving that Christ is God because it says for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. Let's talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about that shield in a little while here, but the next point I want to make is the sun also lights our path when it is dark outside. Through dark trials of the mind and of the heart, this becomes a different aspect of the sun. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. You know, pilgrims, they need both as the weather may be, for the cold would smite them were it not for the sun. And foes are apt to waylay the sacred caravan and would happily destroy it if, there were, if it were without a shield. Heavenly pilgrims are not left uncomforted or unprotected. The pilgrim nation found both sun and shield in that fiery, cloudy pillar, which was the symbol of Jehovah's presence. And the Christian still finds both light and shelter in the Lord his God. A sun for happy days and a shield for dangerous ones. Amen. That's why, Je that's why God is both. That's why Jesus is the son of righteousness. But he's also a shield to us. Right? A sun above and a shield around. A light to show the way and a shield to ward off its perils and dangers. Blessed are they who journey with such a convoy. The sunny and shady side of life are alike happy to them. But the lost are not so, right? They grope in darkness. Job chapter 12, verse number 22. He discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. They grope in the dark without light, and he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. Psalm 18, 28. For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. You may walk through darkness sometimes. You may have some very dark trials. And you get so locked into your mind and it gets so dark in there. It gets so dark in fear and doubt and everything else. But you know what? The Lord is the son of righteousness. And it says, for thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. The closer you get to Jesus, the lights turn on. The lights come on the closer you get to Christ. If you are feeling in doubt and fear and darkness, then you run to Christ. You say, but I have. Keep running. Keep running. Keep knocking. Keep asking. Amen. Keep asking. Psalm 27, 1. Excuse me, we read that one. Psalm 36, 9. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. If your way is dark and your trial is dark, go to Christ. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. We see light the closer we get to Christ because he is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You have got to seek his face. Oh, you have not yet. You say, I have. No, you haven't yet because the lights do shine. When the closer you get to him, the light does shine. I promise you, according to the scriptures, that the son of righteousness will come. He will rise with healing in his wings and he will heal you. He will come. He will lighten your darkness. He will do that because he promised it in his word. And he is a son and he is a shield to his people. And he will heal you. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. In Christ, the son of righteousness, our way is made clear and plain. 
Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. See that? The entrance of thy word giveth light. Man, I'm going to tell you what. I've had some pretty dark nights, and I ain't joking. And I ain't bragging either because it ain't nothing to brag about, and it wasn't very much fun. But I'll tell you something. I've had some pretty dark nights where my eyes were literally prevented the night watches, and they were like that wide, that big, big eyes, right? And they were that big, and they weren't shutting. And I needed some light. And I'm telling you, sometimes the Lord said, well, son, you're going to read all night. He didn't tell me that at the beginning. <laughs> but, but I just kept reading. An hour would go by, another hour would go by, another hour would go by, another hour would go by. So he just keep going by. And I had to forget about it and say, well, Lord, I'm just going to keep reading until you show me something and put me to sleep. So they just keep reading and reading and reading and reading and reading. Man, I got a lot of light. Guess what, though? Guess what happened? The entrance of thy words giveth light. Eventually, the lights come on. Amen? Because God speaks to you. You say, but I haven't experienced. I'm not there yet in my trial or where I'm at in my life. I'm not there yet. Keep, keep reading. Keep searching. Keep crying. But not to man, to God. Cry out to him in the night watches. When it's dark outside and you need the son of righteousness, you have to ask. Amen. You have to ask. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Mm -hmm. When the sun of righteousness shines his light upon us, he uses his word to light our path. The lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. He's the lamp and the light. Right? Psalm 119. Or excuse me, Psalm 139, 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. God's not afraid of the dark. The darkness that is in your, in your heart, the darkness that creeps up onto you in the trial of your life when you're at the darkest most desperate, depressed, discouraged point of your life, the, dark, the darkness is afraid of him. He is not afraid of the darkness. The darkness flees when the light comes. And you have to seek him. You have to seek him. You have to seek him with all your heart. You say, but I have. Oh, not yet. Because when you do, the lights go on. They do. They go on. He is a son. He is a son. He is the son of righteousness, and he is our son. And he lights our path. He brings warmth. But he's not only the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. The son of righteousness is a shield as well. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse number 31. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 31. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. You know what a buckler is? It's a shield. Sometimes it's made out of leather and carcasses of everything, uh, of animal, different animals, and it covered them. It was a shield made out of that, and it covered them. He is a buckler to all them that trust him. For who is God save the Lord, and who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hind's feet. And setteth me upon my high places. That's the God that I serve. You ever been there before? You ever been on some shaky ground? You ever watched a deer? Man, I remember sitting in a deer. I was sitting in this like cleft kind of one time in this side of this, um, I would call it like there was a valley here and I was at the top of it, or actually in the middle of it. And I was sitting in this high, and I was hiding in this cleft. And I have my 
It's the first year I went hunting. <laughs> and I had my, my shotgun out. And all of a sudden, this buck, man, he was a big buck. Everything's a big buck when you're out there, though. And he, man, he was a big buck. And I was sitting there. And he come walking on the side. Not a problem. Just walking right, right down that little trail on the side. You see him walking on the sides of cliffs and everything else. And, 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 and you're like, how in the world are they getting up that? It's because they have hind's feet, right? They have, their feet, their feet, their footing is so steady. That's the feet that our shield gives us. That's what the Lord gives us. He gives us those feet that though we're on a rocky area, though we're on a shaky ground, though we're there, he makes us steady. Right? He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. That's the shield of faith. You know, you know what the real problem is, don't you? You've got the shield and you don't use it. You have the shield and you don't exercise it. You don't work out with it. You don't use it. You leave it at home. You leave it put away. You don't take it out. You don't exercise it, and you get beat up. Because, hey, just so you know, when you don't use the shield of faith, the fiery darts still come. They just don't hit the shield. They hit you, and they penetrate, and they cause damage to you because you're not using the shield you were given, right? Right? Genesis 15, 1, after these things, Genesis 15, 1, look what he said to Abram. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. He said, Abram, I'm thy shield. Mm. And thy exceeding great reward. Psalm 5, 12. Psalm 512, for thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. He is a shield. Spurgeon said this, he said, as a son, he shows me more and more of my sinfulness. When he shines those rays, we start to see who we really are. Yep. And that's really bright. Ooh, that's bright. We don't like that. Ooh, it's bright. Right? But then as a shield, he gives me power to oppose it. And assurance that I shall conquer. See, he's a sun and a shield. For the sun beats down, but he's a shield to protect us from that. From ourselves. He gives me more power to oppose it and assurance that I shall conquer. As a son, he discloses so much of the enormity of guilt that I am forced to exclaim, Mine iniquities are like a sore burden too heavy for me to bear. But then as my shield... He shows me that he has laid the load on a, sh- on a surety or a savior who bore it into the land of forgetfulness. As the son, he makes me daily more and more sensible of the utter impossibility of my working out a righteousness of my own. But then as a shield, he fastens constantly my thoughts on that righteousness of his son, which is meritously conveyed to all who believe on his name. At one, as the son, we cry, woe is me, for I am undone, for I am an unclean man with unclean lips and dwell in the midst of an unclean people. But as my shield, 
my thoughts fastened to Christ and how he paid my debt for me. And that it's by his grace, it's by what he did on Calvary for me, that I'm forgiven. Not by anything that I've done, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's Christ's work, not mine. As a son, in short, he brings facts to my knowledge inasmuch as he brings myself and mine enemies to my knowledge, which would make the matter of deliverance seem out of reach and hopeless if he were not at the same time a shield to me. But seeing that he is both a shield as well as a son, the disclosure, disclosure which he makes as a son only prepares me for the blessings which he imparts as a shield. Who then shall wonder that after announcing the character of God, the psalmist should break into expressions of confidence and assurance? It may be that as the corruption of nature is brought continually before me, deeper and wider and darker, Satan will ply me with the suggestion of this. The guiltiness is too inveterate to be eradicated and too enormous to be pardoned. And if God were a son and nothing more, it might be hard to put away the suggestion as a device of the father of lies. I might then fear. I might fear God's holiness, thinking I should never be fitted for communion with deity. I might fear God's justice, thinking I should never find acquittal at the last dread, dread assize. But can I fear either when beside a son God is also a shield? Can I fear God's justice when as a shield he places sufferings to my account, which satisfy the law, even the last penalty? Can I fear his holiness when he gives me interest in an obedience which fulfills every precept? Does not the one character, that of a shield, help me to scatter those solicitudes, which may, be, may well be excited through the operation of the other character and that of a son? And am I not warranted, nay, am I not living far below my privilege if I fail in deriving from the combination of character a boldness and a confidence not to be overborne by those suspicions which have Satan for their author? See, Satan will taunt you with the fact that God is righteous and a sun shining because he doesn't want you to think about the fact that he's a shield to shield me. The one, as a son, God shows me myself. As a shield, God shows me himself. The son discloses my own nothingness. The shield shows me divine sufficiency. The one enables me to discern that I deserve nothing but wrath and can earn nothing but shame. The other, that I have a title to immortality and may lay claim to an enduring inheritance in heaven. I learn in short from God as the son of righteousness that I have wages, I must have eternal death. But from God as a shield, that if I will receive the free gift, I may have eternal life. Who then shall I fear? Myself, confessedly, my worst enemy. The sun makes a man start from himself. The shield assures him that he shall be protected against himself and build it up for a habitation of God through the spirit. Shall I shrink from Satan and the host of principalities and powers? The sun shows them awful in their might and vehemented in their malice. But the shield exhibits them spoiled and led captive when Christ died and rose again. Shall I dread death? Indeed, the sun makes death terrible, forcing me to read God's curse in the motionless limbs and moldering features. And then the shield displays the open sepulcher, the quickened dust, the marvels of a resurrection, the mountain and the ocean and the valley yielding up the sleeping generations. Is death to be dreaded? Take the catalog of things which, inasmuch as we are fallen creatures, God as our son instructs us to fear, and we shall find that in so much as we are redeemed creatures, God as our shield enables us to triumph over all our fears. Who therefore shall hesitate to agree that there results from this combination of character? Exactly that the system of counterpose, which we affirm to be discoverable in grace as well as in providence. Who can fail if indeed he have been disciplined by that twofold tuition, 
which informs man first that he has destroyed himself and then that God hath laid help on one that is mighty. The former lesson humiliating, the latter encouraging, the one making way for the other so that the scholar is emptied of every false confidence that he may be fitted to entertain the true. Oh, who we say can fail to gather from the combination of divine character the inference drawn by the psalmist to exclaim that it is after recording that the Lord is a sun and a shield. He will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Why need a saint fear darkness when he has such a sun to guide him or dread dangers when he has such a shield to guard him? And now some closing thoughts I want you to think about. Number one. The sun rises and sets, and Christ arose from the dead. When you look at the sun, it is a picture every day of what Christ did, how he rose from the dead. Number two, that the sun lights upon every man. John 1, 9 says, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The influence of the sun reaches every creature. It penetrates into the bowels of the earth and reaches into the depths of the sea. And the influences of Christ reach throughout all the earth. Psalm 139.7 says this, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. That sun that shines, that sun of righteousness, to the lost, he will burn them up in his coming and destroy them. But to those of us that are saved, we need not fear the sun. Because he's a shield to us as well, and he comes with healing in his wings. And he burns off the dross. When he burns, when that sun shines, when the sun of righteousness, when Jesus Christ shines upon you, he will burn off the dross in you and make your faith perfect. And that's what he is doing through the trials and through the tribulations. He is burning off the dross. He is burning as he rises with healing in his wings. Remember, when, he, when that sun rises, when that sun of righteousness rises, he heals. Those rays of the sun that come upon us, they burn off only what's necessary to be gone and keep only what is necessary to live. The closer you get to the sun, the more he burns off. Do you understand that? The closer you get to the Lord, the more he will burn off your dross. He will burn off the waste. He will have you kick off the weight and the sins with just so easily beset you. And he will painfully conform you to his image because we love ourselves too much. And that's the only reason it's painful is because of our pride and because of our fallen nature and because we do not surrender to his righteousness. But many times we try to hold on to this life all too much. We try to hold on to everything that pleases us, that, make us, that makes us happy. We live in the flesh too much. And he has to show us that his children can never live in the flesh and be joyful. But they must walk in the spirit. They've been saved from the course of this world. They've been saved out of Egypt. Remember what he said, out of Egypt have I called my son. Amen. He called you out of the world. and He will not let you be attracted to the world for very long before he will deal with you and keep you from that. So when the son of righteousness rises with healing in his wings, it doesn't feel like healing at first. It burns. Because it's it's not pleasant to burn off the dross because we love some of that dross, don't we? We love some of that putrid waste that God hates. We love it. But we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. 
So you and I have a duty to go to God, to become closer to the Son, to get closer to the Son of Righteousness, so He can and He will heal us. Heal our infirmities, right? And He'll burn off that dross, right? His fan is in His hand, right? And He cleans the wheat. He makes it clean. That's what he's doing to you. That's what he does to all of us. We have to accept it so we can grow thereby. The best way you can do that is to surrender to it. Let the Lord change you. Let the Lord conform you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Yield yourselves as instruments of righteousness. Surrender to him daily. Surrender. The more you fight it, the worse it is. The more unhappy you'll be. The more without joy you'll be. But when you obey him, he will heal you. When you surrender your desires to his, 